this talk, this is a new talk, I've done several CCONs. It's kind of like, I feel like it's a bit of a homecoming each year with CCON. And what it is, for me, it's a way to kind of take stock. So what I try and do, is, typically I do a new talk each time, I'm trying to sort of take stock of where I'm at. So this talk is kind of what I've learned in the last 10 years, is what this is about. Um, how to make a change. So what I've realised, I've been doing consulting -ing for a bunch of time now, and a lot of what I do um, is, is kind of going in typically after other very big consultancies who've come in and agile stuff or whatever they do, right? And then the, the people who are there, they go like, well, that, that didn't work. <laughs> That was a very expensive exercise in handing money to a consultancy. Um, what are we going to do? And I tend to get brought in for the what are we going to do bit. So what I want to share with you is what I try and do that's a bit different and give you some things hopefully that you can go and try it as well. Um, the main thing that I find really, and this is staggeringly, st it just, I, I've no, I, I can't put in words, is that I start here. I start by trying to understand the goal, understand what is the client's intent, what are they trying to achieve, rather than saying, well, the problem you've got is that you don't have safe yet. <laughs> the problem you've got is you don't have less. So you implement safe and now you've got two problems. You've got the problem you had and safe, right? <laughs> and so, okay, understand the goal. So last year I, I kind of drew a picture like this, or put up a picture like this. I said there's really two parts to what a business is trying to do. Part of it is baking the cake right, and we call this product development. Okay, so this is ways of working, this is how we do stuff. But that's kind of inside an outer thing of baking the right cake, actually building the right product, doing the right thing in the first place, which we call product management. And I've been super lucky over the last five years, I was working with this very big Indian business, and I built a little team of just amazing people. So I've been busy learning right, like crazy for the last few years. Particularly, one of the team is a you know, world-class, well-renowned product management person, and I've, like, I've just had this massive immersion into product management that's made me very happy. So what I do is I talk to my clients, and they say things like this. They say, right, in terms of build, baking the cake right, what kinds of things, what's on your mind? What are you trying to do? And they say, we want to ship faster, right? But what they're really saying, the question behind the question is, we want to ship faster without cutting corners. Anyone can ship faster by just cutting corners, you know, burning people out. That's easy. We want to do the other thing. Or they might say, I want to spend less. I want to spend less money. Um, funny enough, the, the engagement I was, I was in came to a rather abrupt end because they're going to spend less. Right? And spending less is getting rid of people even if they're helping you. you know, so getting rid of people who are saving you money doesn't seem to me like a good way of saving money. But, again, what they're saying is spending less but without hurting performance, right? It's easy to spend less by just, you know, scrimping on everything, but then your, your quality becomes rubbish. Speaking of which, improve quality. But again, the question behind the question isn't improve quality, it's improve quality, but without loads more process, loads more money, loads more whatever. I want things to get better, how can we do that? Um, and then in terms of baking the right cake, they say things like this. So they say things like, I want to find the target. Right, who is my customer? What are, you know, what, understanding what their needs are. Then it's hitting the target. Um, so, okay, we've figured out what we need to do. Now can we do it? And this is then about kind of, so this is what part of it is like customer research, part of it is product management and, and that very iterative process of, of building and testing and learning. And then staying on target. Okay, so, um, so uh, staying on target, the market's going to move, the products are going to move, needs are going to change over time. The thing you built, you know, ask Nokia how, they, how well they're doing mobile phones. Right? They, had, they had the world market in mobile phones, and then the iPhone happened. Okay? So that's understanding the goal. Let's look at the understanding part of understanding the goal then. Um, again, it really staggers me that a lot of consulting seems to be selling in a methodology rather than listening to the client. I spend a lot of time listening to the client. So how do I do that? I meet lots of people. It's really, I'm, I know, I'm telling you all my secrets now. Um, <laughs> I meet people. It's crazy. It's crazy, but it might just work. And, and, and what I do, this is, this is my superpower. I listen like I don't know the answer. Right? It's very easy to listen like it's your, you know, waiting for your turn to speak. Okay? Listening like you don't know the answer. What I've learned over 10, 15, whatever it is, a bunch of years, doing like the more of the advisory, helping organizations go fast uh, world rather than the software development specifically world, 
is mostly organisations have smart people in and mostly they want to do good work. Right? I went through this very arrogant phase probably about 10, 15 years ago where I was right and, and I just need to tell everyone what to do because then once they listen to me, they'll be right as well. And it turns out that no, the people in organisations aren't idiots. Um, unless your recruiting process is very, very broken, the people in your organisation aren't idiots. They're just stuck. Right? And you know, as, as uh, John Smart was saying, you know, culture, the, the, the culture will destroy anything you try and put in place. So they're stuck. So you listen like you don't know the answer. Um, and then it turns out you learn stuff. Okay? Um, and then I ask some questions like, what delights you? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Right? What, do you, what do you really enjoy about being here? Why are you still working here? Right? And you know, it really is very rarely the paycheck. Right? There's some elements of this that are still joyful and fun and engaging and exciting. And I go, right, what drives you mad? You know, what drives you nuts? Um, and, and again, you know, it's, listening. it's listening to the story behind the story. So what I tend to do, I'll do maybe a 10 or 12 of these over a couple of days. It's not a, you know, it's a, it's a, it can be broader, it can be deeper. It's up to the client you know, who I talk to. But what I get out of that is themes. Right? So what you might find across 10 different conversations is there's lots of different things that are wrong, but actually they're the presenting symptoms of maybe only two or three underlying actual things we can go after. And we go after those things and suddenly people are going, wow, my life just got better, that's pretty cool. So look for the story behind the story. And then what I do, I play back what I've heard and with options. And I say, right, so here's some things you could just go and do, right? You don't need me for this. If I were you, tomorrow, this is what I'd do. And then I might say, here are some things I can help you with. So some things that you can do, but you'll probably stumble because they're pretty tricky. So that's understanding the goal. It's actually an active listening. And then, and then we need to decide where to start, OK? Um, because what happens, and I've had this more than once, is once you start playing back to people where they're at, and they nod, and they go, well, yeah, I feel heard, you know. And you say, here are some things you can do. And they go, wow, actually, I can, I can play this forward, and I can imagine that would really unstick me. And then they go, let's do it. <laughs> let's fix all the things, right? You cannot fix all the things. So I have what I call my rule of 63. Um, it's, on, it's on my blog, <clears throat> uh, rule of 63. And the rule of 63 is this. Whenever you land anywhere new, if it's an internal move, <clears throat> if you're coming in as an external consultant, <clears throat> excuse me, when you come in, you'll, see, you'll immediately see 63 things that are wrong. Right? And you go, oh, how can you live with this? And, and the rule of 63 is this. Pick three. Pick any three and suck up the other 60. Okay? So if we're going to go after the you know, visualizing, making sure we can understand lead time and, and all that kind of stuff and start getting a few key metrics in place, then you're going to need to suck up the dreadful build, right? And the eye-watering release process. And you're just going to have to sit there and cry inside, right? But we're not fixing that yet, right? We'll come to that later. That's not the, that's not the bottleneck. That's just a catastrophe, okay? So decide where to start. Now we've decided where to start. We look for, and Anna Urbaniak and I have talked about this at length a bunch of times, this idea of autonomy through alignment. So we want teams to be autonomous. We want people to have agency. I love that word from your talk. Yeah, we want people to have agency. Agency creates, well, actually, it creates one of two things. It either creates joy and energy, and energy, and, and energy or it creates overwhelm because people aren't prepared for agency. So you've got to kind of bring agency in with some kind of uh, enablement, facilitation, I think. But So we're looking for alignment. But... I see alignment in two directions in an organization. So the vertical alignment <clears throat> is up and down. We want to establish buy-in, OK? And we want to establish buy-in from the very top to right down in the teams, yeah? <clears throat> What's in it for me? Now, I'm lucky. I, I'm, I'm loud enough and old enough and white and male enough that I tend to end up at a fairly senior level in organizations. So I get to speak to the, the, the senior folks as well as the folks up and down the organisation. There's a wonderful Swedish phrase. It's from a poem. And it says this, when you're talking to farmers, use farmers' words. Right? And then the next line is, and when you're talking to students, speak Latin. Right? When you're talking to farmers, use, use, use the language of farmers. Yeah? And so when I'm talking to the CFO, the CIO, I'm not talking about... Uh, story points and, and organisation and blah. I'm talking about risk and I'm talking about uh, time to market and time to value. And I'm talking about value at risk and I'm talking about I'm using language that they understand and that's their world. When I'm talking to folks in the team, I talk about autonomy and agency and alignment and, and creating an environment in which they can go as fast as they like. You know, when John Smart talks about the safer part of sooner, safer, happier is... Um, 
one of my favourite engagements with there were some uh, compliance and regulatory folks and some technical folks. And we got them in a room, and they're you know historically very adversarial. Uh, and you know, and, and the, from the tech side, the, the the compliance folks' job is to stop them, right? And and actually, from the compliance folks' side, their job is to help them go as fast as they can. Right? If you are within these guide rails, go nuts. Right? <laughs> go as fast as you want. But you need to know where the guardrails are. And we did a bunch of work. Um, this is Anna's everywhere. I've been hanging out with Anna for years and years and years now. Did a bunch of work at a big German bank where we basically, or where they basically uh, created a platform that had all of the compliancy regulatory stuff built in. They called it continuous compliance. If you deployed your code through this platform, all the paperwork magically appeared by paperwork pixies. Right? You know, your release docs, your compliance docs, your MIFIDs, your uh, Sarbanes octets, all of your tick boxes were done. And, and the pitch was you don't have to use it. Right? You're welcome to do your other thing and do all those documents, right? or you can use our thing. And so rather than trying to then you know, sell this idea into the business, they were handling this massive stampede of people trying to get onto their platform. That's a good problem to have. <clears throat> start small and focused. Yeah, so we'll typically start at a program level, maybe 50 to a couple of 100 people, like a single program in a, you know, thousands of people organization. Let's start with one program, not the whole portfolio, not even the whole department, one program, and let's make it famous, right? Let's make it successful, let's make it famous. Choose one program or initiative, and then we federate that goal, right? Through OKRs, you've heard OKRs a few times today. Um, Fantastic tool. Objectives, so make them outrageous, make them exciting, uh, but they've got key results to them, so they're measurable, they're tangible. We can see that progress is happening. And not just the cake, but how we make the cake. Right? So this isn't just business metrics, this isn't just you know, revenue goals or in market segments or any of that, it's also how we do things. So early on, especially when we're trying to get stuff fixed, right? we're trying to change things, um, there's a lot of, of objectives we have around how we do work and bringing people together and making things faster and you know, improving quality and keeping a sense of health around the place. So that's your up e down e. Then there's your across e. And so now we want to get horizontal alignment. And what we mean by this is, so uh, a few years ago, we were at a major UK retailer and they invited me in because they had 90 people building their, all of their online presence, so you know, web and mobile and whatever. And at this point, something like 40% of their revenue was coming through their online presences, right? 40% of their revenue. There's 60,000 people in this company. 3,000 of those are in head office. 1,000 of those are in IT. 90 people were doing all the online stuff, right? So, <laughs> setting up like this. And they were all kind of running off in different directions. There were probably about a dozen teams all doing different things. And so our job was to kind of try and get them all pointing in the same line and, and in the same direction. And it was great fun. And we said, and so of course the fear was this. Dan's coming in, you know, this expensive consultant's coming in. I wasn't that expensive then. This expensive consultant's coming in and he's going to tell us to use Scrum or use Kanban or use some method. And we all like doing our own thing. And what I came in and said was, keep doing your own thing. And they all went, what? So no, you're fine. Keep doing your own thing. Look, you're doing really well. The only request we've got is this. Every two weeks, on a two-week cadence, I need three numbers from you. I need to know lead time. So how long does it take when something drops in your hopper until it's live? Right? I need to know throughput. How many of those things dropped in the last couple of weeks? And I need to know work in process. How many things are you currently working on? And don't worry if those numbers are eye-wateringly bad. You know, lead time could be 18 months, right? That, that, I don't care. What I care is that we, we now know that it's a number. I said, as long as you can do that, you can work how you like. And some of them were like, how do we measure lead time and how do we measure throughput? And so that was work we did with the different teams for how to start figuring that out in their own worlds that were all very different from each other. Um, and Anna was brilliant. So we ended up with this huge wall of this portfolio. It was 90 people, and we had one single wall where we could see every piece of work and where it was and all of the flow metrics. It was just joyful. And then that scaled to 150 people, 200 people. They got in touch recently because they're now at 500 people, and the stuff we put in place is starting to break. I went, yep, it probably will at 500 people. You need other things. And they said, oh, that sounds interesting. So align ways of working by connecting people. Um, this is a this is a mayor culpa. I really messed up here. So, working with a large organisation, 
there's two sort of ways to connect people, if you like. There's practices, which are, or guilds, or whatever your term is, for that kind of horizontal structure where it's a formal organizational construct where the head of the practice or the head of the guild is typically like a senior VP, like a very senior role, and their job is to make sure that you know, testing across 10,000 people is consistent or business analysis across 10,000 people is consistent or whatever it is, that people kind of know what's going on. That's one way. The other way is about building communities of practice, which is much more of a bottom-up kind of uh, viral, you know, um, starting little fires type of thing. I brought in someone who is unbelievably good at the second one and asked them to do the first one and it didn't work out and I burnt a good friendship there and I'm still sad about that. Because it turns out that when you stand back and squint, the mechanics of a practice are very similar to the mechanics of a community of practice. Um, but the way you build them is extremely different, right? One of them is a big old design piece where you're bringing in senior folks and getting lots of buy-in and comms and whatever else, and infrastructure. The other one is about you know, bringing people along, bringing them the story, getting people's lighting fires around the place. Both of them extremely useful, both very different. Uh, um, and then this idea of harvest and amplify. So like I say, start with one little program team and make them famous. So at the, at the retailer, what we did is started road shows. And like some of the teams who were doing really well, they, they would kind of go and do little road shows to, to, to other teams and other parts of the business. And we had people approaching us saying, can we get some of that? That sounds really cool. People are much more likely to listen to people like them than they are to, you know, external hand wavy guy or lady. And, and encourage collaboration, right, on shared goals. So, um, in the seven habits of, of highly effective people, um, they talk about uh, this idea of a scarcity mindset. Uh, Steve Covey talks about scarcity mindset versus an abundance mindset. So, a scarcity mindset is like your zero-sum game. Is, you know, uh, I, I don't want to give this person an opportunity because I'm going to miss out. Yeah? You know, we're fighting over the pie. Right? Abundance mindset says, we can make a bigger pie. Right? <laughs> Let's just make a really big pie. And so you see, uh, I don't know, Tesla. I mean, I'm not a fan of Elon Musk by any stretch, but what, one of the things that Tesla did was they completely opened up their battery technology. They said, any other EV manufacturer is welcome to use our stuff. We're going to open up our patents, go, go nuts. Right? And like a, 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 a traditional economist would be going, that's crazy, that's crazy, that's your IP. No, what they're doing is making a much bigger market for EVs, and in a much bigger market for EVs, they're going to sell a load more Teslas, right? And so if you, and I see this as well with small boutique consultancies, is they'll often partner up. You know, in theory, they should be competing. No, if we come in together, together we are stronger than we are separately, and we can now create an entirely new business model. And it's really exciting. Um, and, then, and then what do we do? <clears throat> then we explore some of these options. Okay, and I'm a massive fan of the Deming cycle, or if you're going to be technical about it, the Schuhert cycle. Um, the Deming cycles are plan, do, check, adapt, uh, plan, do, check, adjust. I'm going to dig into that in a minute. Um, and a, probably a phrase that you've heard a lot today as well, experiments. We run experiments. Um, the problem with experiments is we're rubbish at experiments. Okay? We are rubbish at experiments because science. Right? And again, I'm going to explain a little bit more about that in a minute. So what do we mean by these experiments? Let's take a look at this. Let's co-create this plan. So we work with the client, with the, with the customer, with the team to co-create a plan. We don't come in and say, you're going to do this. We say, where do we think we could go? Where are the opportunities? What are the possibilities, right? And, and, and we present that as a hypothesis. Now, what is a hypothesis, anybody? Pop quiz. An yes. idea you can test. An idea you can test. That's almost right. By disproving. You can disprove it. It's a falsifiable statement, right? It's a falsifiable statement. We are rubbish at falsifiable statements, right? We're very optimistic. We can do this. No, wait. We believe that if we do this, this will happen. We want to test this, okay? Um, so then we baseline. No, we don't. We just jump straight in and start, right? <laughs> okay, ideally, if you're a scientist, if you approach this using scientific method, you baseline. And then, given that we're all going to baseline, we're all going to have a control, aren't we? No. We want to be able to compare apples with apples, okay? There's, I, I, was, I was quite outspoken recently about uh, McKinsey published a paper about measuring developer productivity, and I responded with uh, something of a critique uh, that seems to have picked up a bit of steam. And, and um, 
you know, one of my criticisms, they said, oh, you know, we've, we've done this in 20 different places and, this, and, this, and the, the, the results are looking good, was I think the exact quote. And I was like, A, 20, I mean, great, you're a consultancy and you've got 20 clients, brilliant, good job. That's, that's uh, statistically negligible, right? A sample size of 20 is utterly meaningless. Secondly, you don't know causation from correlation from coincidence. You've got no idea whether the thing you did got the results you observed or whether some other things going on got the results you observed, right? Or whether Hawthorne effect, you know, people were, knew they were being observed, so they worked a bit harder, right? And so on. So, so you know, even very, very experienced consultancies and consultants won't baseline, won't think about how you can uh, identify confounding factors. And the reason we're rubbish at experiments is this, is the point is to falsify the hypothesis, not to prove that you were right. Okay? The way science works is this. You come up with an idea, and you try increasingly ingenious ways to disprove it, and each time that fails, you fail to disprove it, you have slightly more confidence. So Newton proposed a bunch of rules about how the universe works, and for 300 years, we failed to disprove it. And then in 1905, Einstein came along and disproved it. And he came up with another theory about how the universe works, and, and we're currently trying to disprove that. Now, it turns out that Newton's model was really good, right? That's why it took 300 years to disprove it. And so, you know, even like NASA and, and space people, when they're sending off stuff into space, they mostly use Newton's equations, because unless you're very, very tiny, very, very huge, or traveling very, very fast, they're fine. Right? When one of those three things is true, then you go to the much harder Einsteinian model, uh, which involves much bigger computers. So... <clears throat> given the, the theme of, of baking, uh, baking a cake, I want to tell you about my secret ingredient. Everyone's got their secret ingredient. You've got your Tabasco, you've got your turmeric, whatever it is you always put in. My secret ingredient is VESA. Okay? So this is an acronym I, I, I believe I made up. Um, there's, uh, ESSA has been around for a while, but it's very niche. So let me explain what these things are. Visualize, eliminate, simplify, standardize, automate. Don't worry, I'm going to go into each of these, okay? This is my tried and trusted key ingredient when I'm trying to do any change, when I'm working with a team trying to do any change. The first thing we do is visualize, turn the lights on. As, as, um, as John said, I use this, this idea of like, you're in a room full of tigers, it's dark, I turned the light on. Don't blame me for the tigers, right? They were already there. And then someone said to me, but now the tigers can see you. <laughs> I was like, okay, you're in a room full of bear traps. <laughs> And I'll turn the light on. So visualize is turning the light on. <clears throat> Eliminate is then take away. Well, let, let's, let's take a look at these. Visualize. What do I mean by visualize? Value stream mapping. Okay, map value streams. We've heard lots about value streams today. Look at what work gets done in order to meet a customer need. That's all the value stream mapping is. I'm a massive fan of an activity called event storming. Event storming is getting all the people together involved in that value stream in a room with a bunch of post-its or online with a bunch of Miro post-its, but in-person is much better energy. Um, and these flow metrics, and you know, and, and Anna, I'm gonna keep name-checking you, Anna, sorry, is the master. I, I met Anna about seven, eight years ago, and Anna's background is like PMI, Prince2, very formal methods. And I kind of gave her the, the, the red pill, <laughs> showed her like, you know, Reinertsen and Goldrat, and she was like, wow, this is way more useful, let's do that. And so now she's a brilliant Trojan horse, because she goes in and talks to PMOs. Right? You're not recording this. Like, she goes and talks to PMOs, and, and, but she can speak their language, and then she just starts messing with them. You know? so eventually, they're like, oh, lean, let's have a look over here. It's brilliant. So you know, getting this stuff visible, honestly, then you just stand back, and they go, wow, I've never seen that before. I, of course we know what to do. Uh, then you've got things like Wardley maps, purpose alignment models. Um, because this is Seacon, all the speakers are contractually obliged to mention Wardley maps. <laughs> Apart from Simon Wardley, who's contractually obliged to explain why everything else isn't a map. Okay. So, uh, Wardley maps, understanding. So, I use Wardley maps and purpose alignment models as a kind of dual. So, Wardley maps allow me to map my estate. So, this is all the things I've got, the services, the products, the apps, the tin, the whatever it is, that, lead, that create value. So, this allows me to look at my, my estate and, and, and imagine what would happen if I moved things around. So if I brought this third-party thing in-house and started building my own, or if I took this thing that we've carefully custom-built over the last 20 years, and it turns out there's some really good generic solutions for it, if I just threw that out you know, and got over the emotional wrench and the sunk cost and replaced it with a much better product, I could just save myself a ton of money and a ton of time. 
So it allows me to have those kind of strategy calls. Uh, purpose alignment modeling is exactly the same thing, but for your work. So let's look at the portfolio of work, what we've got in the hopper for the next year or whatever we've done planning out for. And we say, which of that is genuinely differentiating right, versus just stuff? And which of that is genuinely business critical versus just stuff? And then it allows us to reason about these. Likert surveys. So these are our, our pulse surveys, our um, you know, strongly disagree to strongly agree type thing. It's very easy. Again, we're rubbish at science. It's very easy to do bad Likert surveys. Okay, if you're going to do like, like a survey, get, hire an academic, right? A, they love doing this, right? And B, it's part of their coursework, so they get to write about it and anonymize it. So, like, so academically defensible like surveys are a very powerful tool. Likewise, C4 models. I don't know if you come across this. This is Simon Brown's wonderful, wonderful, super lightweight way of visualizing incredibly complicated uh, systems, uh, computer systems using four levels of basically abstraction right down to you know, deployed pieces. Um, and then demand mapping, capability mapping, which is a bunch of stuff that uh, I cooked up um, in parallel with Chris Matz a bunch of years ago. And we've been sort of doing this independently for a while. And I've still failed to write up how demand mapping works and how um, capability mapping works. Effectively, this is your big room kind of uh, your big room planning exercise. Where and, and this is where sort of safe, you know, appropriates all these things and then completely corrupts them and gets them wrong. So I have a theory that I can do like a reverse safe maneuver, like there's a reverse Conway maneuver, which is if you have to use safe, at least use the things in it properly. And if you use the things in it properly, it's a lot less toxic, right? So one thing that safe does is it says we're going to start with a bunch of feature teams or scrum teams or whatever they are. And, we've, and our planning, our quarterly planning, is two very, very difficult things. The first difficult thing is to take this big chunk of work and slice it into chunks to give to all the teams. And the second thing, which, and then you've got all the dependency, hell, and whatever else. And the second thing, which is much harder, is to weave all that stuff out the back end and turn it back into a product. Okay? So instead, what they actually stole, <laughs> what they appropriated, was a thing called big room planning or uh, capacity planning, which is this. You take all the work, and you take all the people, so the work is the demand side, or the work we've got to do, the people is the supply side, and you just shake it up in a big bag, okay? And the way you shake it up in a big bag, Anna mentioned earlier, you know, these two, three-day exercises where you get everyone involved, you map out all of the work, so external kind of client-facing, you know, customer-facing work, like feature work, uh, internal work, any Kaizen, any system cleanup, any whatever else. Learning and development is first-class work, right? You're changing the system of work. And so on, make all the work visible, and then get people to self-select into where they want to do work subject to some constraints. And you do that over a couple of days. The first time you do it, it's typically a couple of days to plan out a quarter's work, which still isn't over overly onerous. We've had tears, we've had tantrums, we've had rage quits, right? Some people really don't cope with this. And then several quarters in, you're doing the whole thing. You've got maybe 200 people by this point in a room, and you're planning out 12 weeks of work, and it takes half a day. You're done by Thursday lunchtime. It's amazing. When you start to see it really sing, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, and then capability mapping is about understanding what your people's skills and capabilities are, but also what their aspirations are. What do they want to learn about? And that is a fantastically powerful thing to come up with aspiration-based assignment to work. So it's not just, oh, you know Java, go do some Java. It's, right, I'm aware that you want to learn more about how the business works. Well, this piece of work coming up has got a load of domain crunching in it. Why don't you get involved in that? And we'll make sure that we've got uh, John along, who's really, really good at that part of the domain, and he'll sit alongside you and, and coach you. So this is visualized, and there are many, many more, okay? Um, eliminate. <clears throat> I've got a couple of lovely quotes here. Um, this is um, Peter Drucker, a great, great uh, management mind. There's nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency something that should not be done at all. <laughs> I, I love, I wheel this quote out all the time. Right, I, I went into one company, and like, so I wrote back in 2006 or something, I wrote a paper um, called the, the, the Build Production Line. And it was one of the, you know, basically it was me and a couple of buddies at ThoughtWorks at the time describing build pipelines. It was the first time anyone had described build pipelines. And so I got a bit of a reputation as the pipeline guy. So I went into a company, and this, this chap came up to me and says, oh, Dan, Dan, come and look, we've got to show you our build pipeline. And I said, uh, right, okay. Shows me, it's this thing, it's a thing of beauty. Right? It's amazing. It's fully automated, dashboards, all of this stuff, and it's got loads of metrics. And I said, brilliant. Have you put anything through it yet? Uh, no. <laughs> Have you shipped any value? No. 
Right. <laughs> face felt. Like, like, this is great. But, you know, you grow into this, right? This is what you end up with after a couple of years of just shipping stuff and iterating. So, you know, don't start there. Um, and then the wonderful, wonderful Admiral Grace Hopper. The most dangerous phrase is, we've always done it that way. Right? Why are you still doing this thing in your process? We've always done it that way. Why, what would happen if we stopped doing that? Awkward silence. <laughs> We'd all get two days of our lives back each month. Right? Uh, simplify then. Uh, this is obviously a potato peeler. Um, so simplify is this. You know, th this potato peeler, I, I imagine evolved over time. <laughs> Eventually someone needed to realise that you need to pour water on it to stop it overheating, and so on. So I have what I call the CXO test. Right, the CXO test for a process bloke looks like this. You find any, any company, by law, it needs to have a, a CEO, right, a chief exec, and a chief financial officer. So what we do and how much it costs, right? And then they are, they're, they're called officers of the company. So all the other CXO roles, including COOs, CIOs, all of that, they're basically kind of made up, right? They're, they're just there. And so the CXO test is, I look at, when, when, you, when I look at a board of you know, senior folks in a company, um, it tells you something about the company's history. So if they have a chief security officer, we got hacked, <laughs> right? Ah, okay, CISO, yes, when did you get hacked? If they got chief compliance officer, we got fined, right? We don't want that to happen again, <laughs> chief compliance officer. Uh, chief product officer, yeah, we got blindsided. <laughs> yeah. Nokia, chief product officer, right? Um, you know, we need to have someone at the top of the company in charge of product. You don't, you don't. Uh, chief people officer, yeah, we got sued. <laughs> right? No, we got chief people officer. So l look at those kind of senior exec roles, and it gives you a really great kind of history of the organization. Um, and then we're going to standardize. So once we've made the thing as we've eliminated what we can, we've simplified what's left, now we want to make that thing famous. And the reason we want to do that is not to make everyone into, into these cookies, right? It's that then other people don't need to go through that pain again. So here, we solved it. You know that big horrible thing we do to get stuff into production? Yeah. Turns out we didn't need to do any of that. We sat down with the compliance folks and all of this compliance theatre that we've been doing for the last 10 years, yeah, they said you don't need any of that. They said we need these three numbers and with these three numbers we are confident that we are you know, within the law, we're operating within... Oh, so why don't we just generate those three numbers? You know, we could generate those three numbers automatically out of the build. Could we? <laughs> right, well, that all that just went away. So let's, give them, let's share that. If people want to be snowflakes, if they want to have different types of cookies, that's fine. We're adults, right? We're grown-ups, and we're going to treat people like grown-ups. As long as they know what they're deviating from. So they know what they should be doing. We know what normal looks like. We know what good looks like. If you need to do something situationally specific here, that's great, as long as you can defend it. So, and, and for me, there's, there's a lovely phrase that I use. Uh, for me, this is difference is data, right? When I see things that aren't how we should be doing it, that's immediately signal. Ah, oh, you're doing something unusual over here. Wow, I just learned something about your context that's different from the context over here, right? Uh, when, when you don't have any standardization, people are doing stuff, and I've got no frame of reference whether that stuff is useful and signal, or whether it's just how they happened to do it, or what they did in their last place, or what they inherited, yeah? Um, and then finally, automate. <clears throat> so what do I mean by this? Automate tasks. Automate work. Do not automate the process. So I've got a process, and it involves steps A and B and C. Um, and Karen is in charge of this process, A and B and C. And Karen's been doing this for years, right? So what she does, she does all the A's in the morning, get them out of the way. And then the B's and the C's she does after lunch when Rich is around, because sometimes she needs Rich to help her out with some of the B's and C's. Um, and it means that she can just get on with that. And, uh, and she's optimised this process over a bunch of time, and she's got it really well done. I then automate the process. Do A, do B, do C. Do A, do B, do C. And do you know what I did? I just made an enemy. <laughs> she hates me now. Because the only way she can get this done is to do A, B, C, A, B, C. And what happens is, first thing in the morning, she goes, A, B, stuck. But I can't progress this until Rich comes in <laughs> after lunch, right? I can't get help. Brilliant. So I've just completely destroyed her ability to do work by automating the process. Automate the steps. Make the work easy. Trust the people doing the work to do the right thing. And Tatiana has this lovely word, automation. Automation with a human touch. So we're going to automate, but we're going to automate. Um, we're going to automate understanding that it's people doing the work, and our job is not to eliminate the people, or to make the people into robots. Is to make the people's lives easier, enable the people to get the job done easier. So Vesa, I'm, I talk about Vesa a lot. 
And the thing with VESA is it doesn't matter how far along it you get, you did good. If you just visualize, if all you manage to do is visualize, right, that's brilliant. You know, I've had so many times, I've had senior folks, uh, we, we do the value stream map or whatever, and they say, I've never seen the process laid out like that. This is insane. <laughs> Why are we doing this? I can already see a way to shave a third of that off. Right? Brilliant. I, you don't need me. Right? You're the expert. You're the domain expert. I'm just pretty good at modeling stuff. Yeah? So you visualize it, and then you step away. Eliminate. You know, if you manage to eliminate stuff, but you never get to simplify it, that's okay. You just still gave people you know, hours, days, weeks of their lives back, and so on. Um, so that's your plan and your do. <clears throat> now we're going to check. We check against the goal. Um, oh, no, again, it's a lovely, lovely phrase. Look with your feet, think with your hands. What he's saying is go and see the work. Don't trust the stats. Don't trust the evidence. Because as information moves particularly upwards through a, an organization, it goes through the what you want to hear filter. Right? If I ask you how things are, you don't tell me how things are. You tell me what I want to hear. When will it be done? It's not when will it be done. It's can you guess the number I'm thinking of? Right? Where are we done? Are we done by May? May? April? <laughs> April? April? March? <laughs> you know, and you've just got this dance going on. Go and see, right? Look with your feet, um, think with your hands, okay? Um, and then adjust based on evidence. <coughs> so we, we've done this thing, we've, we've attempted to falsify what we're doing, we've failed to falsify it, that's given us a good feeling. So we twist, let's do it some more. Right? Let's, let's, let's double down on it. Let's, let, let's, let's invest more in that thing. Or we look at what we've got and we think we're hitting a diminishing return. Now it's time to stick. Okay? Let's, let's stop doing this or fold. You know, we tried it. It blew up in our face. Right? But the way in which it blew up in our face is signal, is useful information. And now let's go and clear up that <laughs> and start a new thing. Okay? And then, of course, do it all again. Yeah? Are we still baking the right cake? Are we still baking it the right way? And do we still have everyone with us? You know, is everyone still engaged? Does everyone still understand what's in it for them? Are all these people, do they have agency? Do they have autonomy? Do they have that bouncing into work energy? Yeah? So, quick recap then, our rules of the kitchen. First thing is understand the problem, okay? And don't just rock up with a solution. Yes, I'm looking at you, big scaling frameworks, all right? Um, it's, uh, what's his name? Um, he wrote Secrets of Consulting. Uh, Jerry Weinberg, he has this lovely word, solutioneering, uh, which is where you come in with a solution. You go, right, I've got a solution. Now, I, what, what, I don't care what your problem is. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do less or safe or blah. Um, listen. Listen to the people. They know their context better than you, right? And time and again, I've, this, is, this is advice to me. This is me giving advice to, to me. Um, time and again, I've gone in, oh, you know, I even, especially if it's a domain that you know, you still don't know their context, Yeah. Seek alignment. Seek alignment across the organization, communities, bottom up, practices, top down, or guilds, or whatever. Um, but get people who, make, who do similar work connected up across the organization, especially in what I call the lonely roles. So if you get a team, you might have one tester in that team, right? You might have 10 developers in that team. You've got one, one tester in that team. That person's lonely, yeah? Connect them up with all the other testers. Suddenly, real sense of belonging, purpose, autonomy agency. Try small, iterative, evidence-based changes, right? Uh, science is hard. VESA is your friend, right? Um, and be prepared to change the recipe. You know, if it's not working, then, then, then try other stuff. Um, that's all I had time for. Thank you very much.